Ago, Ago Medasi, Ago Medasi, West African tree. Just saying your attention, please, and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we want to start by indicating that we have a name for this broadcast, and that name is on your screen, Our Ancestors' Voices. So from here forward, that's how we will be referring to this Sunday broadcast, Our Ancestors' Voices. It was seems like a very appropriate title for what we are attempting to do here, and we hope you are able to maintain your highest level of mental, physical, and spiritual health. Um, we are excited about the topic that we're here to address today, Cuba, protests, and U.S. imperialism. So thank you all for joining us. We want to just start by um, acknowledging, as we always do, the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. And I, I want to just give a special shout out to our comrades up in Oregon. Um, our comrade Miko from and the other comrades from the American Indian Movement up there supporting that work. And I'm mentioning them, you all, because they, they do it the way we continuously talk about it needs to be done. They have their own channel called Education, and they have nothing but educational materials, events, activities, resources on there that they strongly encourage the people participating on that page to to check out. So they, you know, they constantly will talk about, you know, what this our ancestors voices is talking about and encourage people to do that. And that's that's is really the spirit of what we consistently talk about doing it that way and really encouraging people to let people know about these independent revolutionary African voices. It cannot be overstated. Um, voices like the All African People's Revolutionary Party, programs like this, Black Alliance for Peace, Hood Communists. We really need you all to make a personal commitment that when you participate in these programs from those entities and other entities that you're gonna bring somebody, tell at least tell somebody else. A lot of people don't even tell anybody like this is going on. Like this is how we build capacity. It's not just for your individual uh, ego satisfaction and learning something. We're trying to build and move forward. So we have the capacity to fight against our enemies. So, you know, you can't just be consumers in this process. We need your help. We need you to do a little work. So we encourage you to do that. And we thank them. We thank our comrades from AIM for what they do. And we want, you know, we continue to do the same for them because that's how we're going to get free, you all. So we give nothing but respect and honor to our indigenous family members. We're talking about the American Indian move, uh, American Indian people, you all, when we say indigenous. We're not talking about all of you who are living in some fantasy world and, and you want to connect yourself to the land as indigenous people, but you don't know anything about the indigenous people and you certainly you know, are not doing anything to help move their struggle forward. We're not talking about that confusion. We're talking about the real original inhabitants of the Western hemisphere. And of course, we wanna honor our African ancestors. And we start by acknowledging the physical transition of Robert Paris Moses, uh, Bob Moses, as he was more popularly known, who was one of the original stalwarts of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and just gained a reputation in the early 60s for his ability to face violence and potential death with a calm and confidence that rubbed off on other comrades. And even people who you know, had political disagreements with him, uh, folks like Kwame Ture had nothing but respect for Bob Moses because of his consistency and then his later activities which he engaged in till his physical transition yesterday uh, of implementing a program to teach inner city youth math and doing that for 50 years, um, this man did that. So he was a, a very critical part, not as well known, um, but was a, this, the program coordinator for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and all the folks out there that always hollering about voting and, and don't even know who Bob Moses is, don't even know what the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party is, 
And without those sacrifices, you wouldn't even be able to fix your mouth to yell what you're yelling today. So the first thing that needs to happen is people got to know who these people are and how they sacrifice for us. And Bob Moses was certainly someone that deserves respect for putting his body on the line for justice and liberation. So we honor him today and his life of struggle. And so we're glad that you're here for this session. Again, I'm gonna say our name over and over, our ancestors' voices, that's our new name here. So Shakur and I are, and the All African People's Revolutionary Party are so grateful that you've joined us today for Cuba protests and US imperialism. We're gonna talk about what's really happening in Cuba, debunking the lies coming out of Washington, DC and Miami, Florida uh, with concrete facts and analysis. That's what we're here to do today as we are here to do every week. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with the program for today. And we start with the general introductions. I'm a longtime organizer for the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And with me is my daughter, Shakura, who grew up in the All African People's Revolutionary Party and participates as an adult now. That's a wonderful thing. And going back, we talk about the objective of the APRP is Pan-Africanism, Pan-Africanism, one unified socialist Africa. And our strategy on the right, Kwame Nkrumah's Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, um, uniting with all Pan-African formations on the ground in Africa to build a worldwide fighting force to achieve Pan-Africanism. And we certainly hope, and we'll have information at the end, you join us next Saturday for Pan-African Women's Day. It's gonna be an international webcast. And again, we'll give the details, but um, you will see many of these organizations, you see their logos here. The Amilcar Cabral Ideological School out of Nigeria has a participant, a sister participating in Pan-African Women's Day. The African Party for Independence of Guinea-Bissau, our sister comrade, who is the Secretary General for the National Union of Guinea-Bissau Women within the PAIGC, Udama, uh, will be issuing the keynote presentation during Pan-African Women's Day. Um, women from the Kenyan Socialist League will be participating, the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, or what you call South Africa. So when we say that we're fighting for Pan-Africanism, y'all, that's real talk. It's not just an idea in our heads. And for those that doubt it, you know, you can get a live presentation next Saturday, July 31st, Pan-African Women's Day. And you should support Pan-African Women's Day anyway, because until women, women identifying people, people that don't identify as men are free, nobody's gonna be free. And I am certainly not gonna sit around waiting on men to lead the struggle for freedom because I'll, I'll be dead, buried and forgotten before that happens. So we definitely wanna raise up our sister and sister identifying people because they are have always been and always will be the spark to carry out this real fight that needs to be waged. So we also, of course, have chapters everywhere and unite with other liberation movements that are fighting for their just liberation. We stand in solidarity and work with everybody who's for justice on this planet. So Cuba protests and US imperialism. We are glad you're here to join us and we start, I will turn it over to Shakur to get us going. Good evening, good day, good afternoon, everyone. We hope that you are in good spirits. Thank you so much, Daddy, for starting us off. We're really excited today to talk to you all about the truth of our comrade family, Cuba, and how they are not only succeeding and doing very well in terms of helping the rest of the world, but selflessly doing it as they have always done. And we look forward to sharing some credible resources with you as well, because we definitely wanna encourage you to basically understand that if you are seeking information from sources that are paid for by people that are not well-intentioned in terms of their lies and their mistruths that they are spreading and, and disseminating, then that would be the first problem in how you are accessing the information. Is the person or the media outlet or the organization you're seeking it from is not based on truth and integrity. So you're already being misled. Also, their job is to make Cuba look bad because for whatever reason, 
they're trying to earn the identity that Cuba is sorry and in need of all this support and help when in actuality, Cuba is responsible for saving the lives of millions of people around the world, not just as an example of their antiviral vaccine that they came out with over a year and a half ago before the first Pfizer vaccine participant participated in the trials. But beyond that, they've been saving our lives for millions and millions of centuries. And we've given examples of that, as time will tell, throughout our 90 weeks or so of doing these seminars. So we are excited to talk to you today. I personally want to share a resource that my dad shared with us in work study yesterday. So I'll mention that before I finish my, my next slide. But as of right now, we have to understand that over the past couple of weeks, the Western news outlets have been ablaze with reports of unprecedented protests in Cuba. The reason we are being given for these never before seen protests, quote, end quote, are that the Cuban people are protesting food and medicine shortages as a result of the adverse impacts of the pandemic. Consequently, what we are being told by the capitalist media is that the Cuban people are ready to overthrow socialism due to this phenomena. Now, let's just stop right there and just like unpack what that means. So the media that we cannot trust is trying to help us understand that people in a socialist country are done with socialism. That already doesn't make sense because we know that the media who is spreading these lives is based on supporting capitalism. And the definition of capitalism is to make sure that it maintains private profit, excuse me, private industries to maintain their profit. So if the media is losing out on gaining money from that because more entities are understanding that socialism is a way, then that's dipping into their pockets. And so they can't have that. So they're trying to spread these lies and mistruths to make sure that we continue to criminalize socialism like it's this horrible system that does not work. Well, we know that that's simply not true. The problem with this perspective is that the Cuban revolution has developed a reputation that even capitalist institutions like the World Health Organization and the United Nations are forced to respect as it relates to the priority the Cuban revolution systematically places on taking care of people. That's the second reason why the media is so comfortable with disseminating mistruths and lies is because the media that we follow, the capitalist entity that we follow, it's not based on human perpetuation and human success. It's based on profit. So because socialism puts people first, that's a problem. Because socialism in Cuba put people first, that's definitely a problem. And so the objective is to highlight Cuba and to highlight the people in Cuba as anything but understanding that socialism is still and will always be the answer to ending oppression. I just need us to really understand that. And you have to understand if you're looking to find resources, look at where those resources are coming from. Who's putting money in those people's pockets? Because nine times out of 10, they're not gonna be for humanity to be free because that would affect their money income. And we all know that some people are more selfish when it comes to earning money than others. So we have to think about that. And we also have to think about how this means that we cannot prioritize people as the forefront anymore because that would mean that socialism is bad and we should instead turn to capitalism, which we know is not the answer. So in other words, before and during the pandemic, all healthcare in Cuba is free, not just because of COVID-19. This has been the situation since before I was born. And I'm talking about I'm in my mid 30s now. So this this has been a consistent thing that Cuba has offered. My dad gave this example a couple of times about while wow, the last time he went to Cuba, he had some dental issues and was able to get um, a very severe um I can't remember the exact procedure, but he's mentioned it in the seminars, but it was a very severe procedure where there was a need to put him to sleep and there was some treatment and medication recovery afterwards, and he paid nothing for it. And then he had a similar situation a couple of months ago. And, you know, they're still asking him for money after the fact, not to mention the fact that he does have insurance and he has good insurance at that. So just think about how Cuba has done that countlessly for people. Think about how they train their doctors to send doctors around the world to make sure that people have access to medical care in rural communities where they have hospital deserts or communities where they don't even have insurance because they can't even think about what that looks like. Think about the fact that Cuba trained all these doctors when the pandemic first started and sent these vulnerable essential doctors to communities where the rates were the highest to help people and to make sure that more people didn't die from COVID. 
That's the community we're talking about, where they are willing to put their lives on the line, not once, not twice, but for thousands of centuries to make sure that people have what they need. That's amazing. And we have to make sure that we understand that because they have come to our rescue so many times, as my dad said it yesterday, it's time for us to stand up and come to their rescue and to help them out. So we know that healthcare in Cuba is free. There is one doctor for every 100 people in Cuba. This is in comparison to the one doctor for every 1,500 people in the United States. And those 1,500 people still have to have money to see the doctor in this country, something that is not required under any circumstance in Cuba. Whether you need a root canal, heart surgery, diabetes care, cancer treatment, it doesn't matter. All of it is free. Every single thing that you could look for, if you have physical therapy, if you need uh, some type of mental health services, if you are interested in OBGYN services, if you're interested in artificial insemination services, whatever your thing is that you're interested in seeking care for, there's no cost for it. All of it is free. So with that type of institutionalized system, even with the shortage of medicines available in Cuba due to the 60 plus years of US economic blockade against Cuba, it seems more than logical that most people in that country would have the patience with their health systems. And they also have the foundation and the trust because their health system has not stirred them wrong in their whole entire life that they've lived in Cuba. Even when it's been hit hard by the pandemic, their healthcare system is still thriving so much better than what we have here in the U.S. Not to mention, let's think about how Cuban doctors treat one another, right? Like, let's think about how they treat one another. And let's also think about how they probably already have an idea of what patient-centered care looks like because they value their patients and what? They want their patients to be healthy. They're not interested in making sure that they give their patients whack medication uh, prescriptions that really enhance the sickness so that they can continue to come back and make profit off of that. No, they actually do not want you to come back to the doctor. Like, that's a idea that some of us have never even fathomed before because it's impossible to think about that. We are so confident in understanding that our quote unquote chronic illnesses or chronic diseases are just going to always be a part of our life because that's what our doctors have told us. If our doctors are even listening to us because listening is not something that is very common again in US healthcare systems. And now we're starting to dabble into what my dissertation is about. So I've done a lot of research on understanding that communication is key to how doctors give care in the US and it sucks for lack of a better term, but not in Cuba. They don't even understand what that looks like because they know how to value people in Cuba. We would argue that what makes people most upset with healthcare systems is not that people get sick, but that once that happens, if you don't have proper resources, income, finances, things of that nature, you cannot get the treatment you need despite all the resources and people required to provide that treatment being physically available. In Cuba, the people are available and working overtime to help with people when they have sickness and they have treatment needs and whatnot. And that's very little for the most part because we still understand that they still have systems in place to actually manage their pain, manage their treatment. So again, they're not interested in having you come back every week. They're trying to really figure out what's the foundational problem so that we can address it and make sure that you don't have to invest your energy, time, and mental health coming back again and again and again for more tests because that's not benefiting you. It's actually increasing your sickness. And our goal as providers is to really make sure that you have what you need so that you don't have to come back to us. What an amazing concept. Just imagine if other countries adopted that. Do you have any idea how much healthier everyone would be? It's fascinating when you really think about it. This is public health right here. Cuba is clearly understanding that public health is the key. They understand that. Cuba, the people are available and working overtime to help people with what they have, which is very little. But still, to tell us that people are attacking the system for this, it just doesn't make sense. Next slide. Okay, so the other primary reason being provided for the reasons behind all of these alleged protests has been people in Cuba are upset about the struggles of their national socialist economy, i.e. the inability to provide food resulting in a rampant starvation. This is very strange. This is a very strange allegation because even according to the imperialist controlled institutional data, such as that released by the United Nations, there is no evidence that Cuba's economy is less capable even in its present state to provide for its people 
in the ways that neighboring Caribbean countries can only dream of. For example, infant mortality rates in Cuba are not only much lower than that of any other country in the Caribbean, but they are lower than those in every major city within the U.S. And we've talked about that a little bit. I believe I mentioned to you all that Memphis, where I'm located, I don't know if it's still the highest to this day, but at one point it was the highest in the world. And it was so high, they literally built a baby cemetery here in Memphis just for infants because the stereotype was most infants, specifically African infants, would not make it to their first birthday. And of course, we know that's how you define infant mortality is if the child is able to live past their first birthday. So not only has Cuba outstandingly shown us that they care about their babies and their babies are able to be healthy to grow to the age of one, but it's lower, their infant mortality rate is lower than even some of the cities here in the United States. The Socialist Cuban Society provides food subsidies to its people every month, such as rice, grain, coffee, et cetera, as supplements to incomes people earn. As a result, starvation, i.e. people not having enough to eat, houselessness, et cetera, these are things that are still non-existent in Cuba. So the charge that people are protesting due to starvation is lacking in tangible evidence. Even though the blockade and the pandemic has forced the Cuban government to reduce subsidies that were just mentioned, the government offset this action by raising salaries as an economic effort to stimulate the economy. And we definitely wanna talk more about this in terms of the blockade that the US has had with Cuba, but we know that that is part of the reason why the US is trying to bully Cuba is because they know that Cuba is thriving. They know that people like us are on this call right now talking about the benefits of socialism, the benefits of seeing it play out as Cuba as living proof of the thrivingness of that. And they're trying to do everything they can to make, again, criminalize Cuba and make it look like not only is their system of socialism not working, it's ineffective, we need to let that go and we need to come back to accepting the fact that capitalism is the only answer. And we need to continue to make them be fearful of that because we need to continue to be critical and understanding that not only has socialism worked in Cuba, but Cuba has shown us time and time again that there is always another way out. Capitalism is not the only answer. And if you'd like more information, because again, you're sick of following Fox News or you're sick of following CNN, or maybe you're sick of following Twitter because you're still following a person who still has the interests of Fox News in their pockets. Again, their information is not being given to you with integrity. Then you can visit the website, www.g as in goat, R as in Ram, A as in Apple, N as in Nancy, M as in Major, A as in Apple.org. And that should take you to a very credible website that is already translated in English, even if you have Spanish as your first speaking language. Hopefully you are able to convert if you need to, but for those of us that have been colonized to speak English, it's already translated for us. And this is one of the websites that the party has listed on their international website, as well as where we go to to find our resources when we talk about issues that are affecting our comrade family organizations that we are in solidarity and support of. Thank you all so much. And let's continue to stand up for Cuba and continue to stand up for socialism. It takes a very brave person to speak out in a crowd and to say that you are in fact a socialist and you do in fact support Cuba. But if you do that, and if you have facts to back up why you're saying what you're saying, then you're able to really show people that there's a new way. And I think it's more than time for us to start it, allowing people to understand capitalism is crumbling and we don't have to follow it anymore. It never worked for us to begin with and it wasn't created for poor people. Let's keep that in mind. Regardless of your race, class, and gender, if you are not in the 1%, capitalism is not going to be effective for you. Asante Sana. Thank you very much, Shakur. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we are going to continue. We're going to break down some data about what's really going on in Cuba. But before I do that, you all, I just want to uh, 
build on what Shakur just said. So grandma.org, that is the official news organ of the Cuban uh, society. So that's their official news organ. And people should be looking at that first. If you have never heard of grandma and you haven't looked at it before, you don't know anything about Cuba. <laughs> okay, you might you might have gleaned some stuff from some people who wrote something or whatever that had integrity. But if you didn't do that, then it's going to be limited what you know, because that's them talking about the work that they're doing. And how do you understand what they're doing and you haven't even gone to the source? No one hearing this would ever accept someone going to your neighbor, asking them information about you and then writing a, uh, an analysis about your life and they never talk to you. No one here would accept that. So since we know that, I don't know why we think it's okay to hear something on MSNBC or CIA network and then say, yeah, I, I know what's going on. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense, but yet that's what happens. And it's insidious, you all. I mean, you have to really be careful now, I, I don't. I sat down a, about a year ago, and I've read two or three books since then on Cuba. But I sat down about a year ago, and I tried to list all the books about the Cuban Revolution that I've read. And I, I had like thirty-seven books that I came up with, and I know I missed some because I, I've been reading about Cuba as long as since I was a teenager. So I, the most recent book that I've read, and I'm not through it yet, but I'm going to finish it. So it's called South Africa versus Cuba in the Angolan Civil War, the last hot battle of the Cold War by this person, Peter Polak. And this book is about, it specifically um, deals with the battle in Southern Africa with the Cuban forces to overthrow the apartheid, the racist apartheid forces in, in the battle that took place at Cueto uh, Carnival that uh, where you know it was decided that uh, you know the racists were not going to win and they had to negotiate and we've talked a lot about what happened with that the release of Mandela from prison the independence of Namibia the independence of, uh, of Angola and you know what that meant um, so the important thing I want to say about this book is that this guy's writing this book and he's writing it from the stamp he's trying to make the argument that the Cubans who went into Africa, Southern Africa to fight, they didn't want to do it. They didn't know they were going there to fight. They didn't want to do it. But then at the same time in the book, he's acknowledging that their fighting efforts were far superior to those of the racist South African troops who he never once says they didn't want to go and fight. He never even addresses that with them. You know, and they were there on the wrong side of history, but yet he never addresses that. And I, I just want to point that out because it's insane. I mean, this is a guy who in the inside cover when he's describing himself, you know, he's some universe, some bourgeois university professor from uh, the University of uh, uh, Cayman Islands. And he lists his, his main hobby is shooting pistols. I mean, this is garbage, you all. But yet this is the kind of stuff that's put out about the Cuban revolution that's supposed to pass as legitimate knowledge. You know, now, because of my intensive study of Cuba, like I can see this stuff and identify the contradiction immediately. But what happens in this capitalist world is people will read a book like this and they will actually think they have a, a solid understanding of what happened in Cuba. And this is about as far away from a primary source as you can get. So that's why, it's important to have these discussions like we're having today. And we are glad that you're here to help us go through this. So we just wanna go through again, some data to help us understand what's really going on right now. Propaganda against Cuba. So we will start by saying that according to the World Health Organization, this is the capitalist organization, you all, controlled by the capitalist countries. And when we say that, what we mean is that their budget is primarily provided to them by capitalist countries like the United Snakes of America. So this is, you know, you pay the cost to be the boss. Like, you know, the US is not gonna, it's not about freedom of, of uh, uh, allowing you to say things that are critical of, of US and capitalist policy. They don't do that. They, they clearly snatch funds from people who do that. That's why they got the blockade against Cuba in the first place. So according to World Health Organization in May of 2021, this is just two months ago, right? Here's how Cuba 
Jamaica and the Dominican Republic compare as it relates to COVID cases. And those are countries that are close physical, historical, and cultural proximity to Cuba, all right? Cuba has had 129,000 cases of COVID reported as of May, 2021. The Dominican Republic has had 280,000 cases of COVID, which obviously is more than double what Cuba has had, right? Jamaica has had 47,000 cases, um, but you know Jamaica only has a population that's one fifth that of Cuba and Dominican Republic have comparable populations around 10 to 12 million people. Uh, Cuba is just a fraction of that. So if you gave, or I'm sorry, Jamaica, I'm sorry, Jamaica is just a fraction of that. So if you gave Jamaica the same population that Cuba has, 11 million people, at the COVID rates that Jamaica was experiencing as of May, 2021, Jamaica would have double the cases, 235,000 cases of COVID based on that formula. So clearly the point is, is that there's no logical argument to suggest that COVID is out of control in Cuba as the capitalist media is telling us. Um, if you look at its neighbors, that, that doesn't make, that's absolutely not true. And if the argument is that, well, people are rising up to overthrow the Cuban government, then they should have done that in Jamaica and Dominican Republic a long time ago. So that's just one fact. Um, and this, pro this proves without a doubt that Cuba obviously by having the reduced cases that they have, have, as Shakura said, continued to find ways to protect their people from COVID, despite having no access to pharmaceuticals because of the 62 year criminal US economic blockade against Cuba, which we'll talk about more in a second. 2020, again, the World Health Organization starvation rates, because the other argument that they're telling you, the reason why people want to overthrow the Cuban socialist um, government is because there's not enough food. And Shakur just talked about how the government provides subsidies and salaries to make sure people can definitely have enough. I'm not saying everybody eats lobster. Everybody don't eat lobster here. Nobody do that anywhere in the world. But the point is, is that they provide based on their limited resources. They make it a priority to ensure everyone has enough so that starvation is never an issue. There is no evidence that starvation has been an issue during the year, 62 years of the Cuban revolution. That is an absolute fact. And I challenge anybody to provide concrete evidence otherwise. You cannot do it because it does not exist. But the starvation rate, our Cuba has two and a half people out of every 100 people that starve. That, friends, is the best starvation rate on the planet Earth right now, okay? In comparison, the Dominican Republic has six out of 100 people starved to death, okay? Jamaica has almost nine out of 100 people who starved to death. Haiti, and this is, you know, Haiti is under extreme attack. And so I didn't even list Haiti's COVID numbers because they're, they're very high, right? But for starvation, Haiti has almost 50, almost half the people who suffer from starvation because of the attacks the Haitian people are under, right? So this is not to diminish the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, or Haiti, but it's to make the point that if they're telling you that people want to overthrow the Cuban government because people are starving, what we're saying is that this doesn't make any damn sense when the neighboring countries have starvation rates that at a minimum triple and in some of these cases go beyond that of people starving. And nobody is talking about anybody in any of those countries overthrowing those governments. And the people in Haiti have been engaged in mass demonstrations for months against the Haitian government. Their president just got assassinated. And nobody is talking about how the Haitian people want to overthrow their government. You will not read that anywhere in the capitalist media because Haiti is a capitalist country. And they don't want to plant that seed in anybody's mind 
that anybody anywhere in the world would have the notion to overthrow a capitalist country. But there in Cuba, we're only two and a half out of 100 people are starving to death. They're telling us that people there are starving. And they're telling us that because of that, people want to overthrow the Cuban government. Now, you, you all tell me how much sense that makes. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I don't care what you know or don't know about Cuba. That's coming from the capitalist World Health Organization. That's not coming from grandma. I didn't get that stat from grandma from the Cubans. That came from the capitalist World Health Organization that is dominated politically and economically by the United States of America. So you know the statistics are probably better than that. The U.S., 11 out of 100 people starve to death in the U.S. So the U.S. starvation rates are five times worse than they are in Cuba. And nobody in this country would write that anybody here is trying to overthrow this government because of starvation. That don't even sound right saying that because it's so foreign to hear somebody say something like that here. But yeah, you're supposed to believe that this is what's going to be happening in Cuba, that this is what's happening right now. We're just sharing facts with you all. That's all we're doing. We're just the messenger sharing facts with you so that when next time you hear this nonsense, you can ask people to clarify, well, how is that so when this is the reality? You know, because these people lie as policy. As Kwame Ture said, capitalism lies all the time. Even if it tells the truth, it's only as a result of a double lie. And that is absolutely correct. 100% correct. So let's talk about understanding Cuba's economy so we can understand why these things have developed the way they are. Let's talk about that. And so before the revolution, Cuba was basically an economic satellite colony for U.S. imperialism. The mafia, as they have historically done throughout the Caribbean, used Cuba as a playground for money-making profits and they were able to work in conjunction. The, the, the U.S. government is not against the mafia. They've worked in conjunction with the mafia for decades because they kicked them down subsidies. And that's how they were able to do that. That's why when the Cuban Revolution succeeded, the U.S. used mafia hitmen mercenaries to try to go down and assassinate Fidel Castro over 600 times. And most of those people were never heard of again because you can't mess with the Cubans like that. They're organized. They don't want nobody to know that, but they're organized. So then people went down there, these bad mafioso hitmen that are displayed in all these Godfather movies and whatever that TV show they had. I don't watch it, I don't know. But they they want to make you think nobody's more dangerous than these mafia hitmen. I'm telling you, dozens of these clowns went down to Cuba trying to assassinate comrade Fidel Castro and have never been heard from again. That's a fact. So they used Cuba as an economic satellite. The Tropicana, Tropicana Hotel right there on the Malacone in Havana, I've been there, uh, where Ricky Ricardo played, right? That's what they told you in the I Love Lucy uh, series. Um, that was basically where people went to gamble, to get drugs, to... Um, uh, to spend money with uh, sex workers. And that was what Cuba wa was before the revolution. But the revolution came about and they went away from that. They made Cuba a government of the people to build a people first society as Shakura mentioned. And in 1962, Cuba publicly declared that they were pursuing a socialist path. And it was from that point forward that they became bitter enemies of US imperialism. They didn't like the revolution from the beginning because they know what they're doing in these countries and they know when there's a revolution that that obviously means people in the country are disagreeing with US puppet strategies in their country. So they knew that in 1959. But once they declared that they were pursuing a socialist path, then that's when the US implemented its blockade against Cuba officially. And once that blockade was implemented, it basically prohibits the entire capitalist world from doing any type of business with Cuba, having any type of business relationship, from ensuring that no foods are shipped to Cuba, medicines, like as I mentioned, pharmaceuticals are not permitted to be sold to Cuba, much needed parts for cars, um, for any type of mechanization that exists there, it's not possible 
to, to be provided to them. Tools are not possible to be provided to them. Even travel there is not possible. You can't even travel. You can't even send money there except under very acute circumstances. So the purpose of the blockade was to strangle the Cuban economy. And these people who have maintained this blockade for 60 years know that was the objective of the blockade. So it's like on one hand, somebody robbing you of every cent you take with you every day. And then on the other hand, talking about, well, how come that person can't pay their bills? Like, what's the problem with well, How come they're not able to meet their financial obligations? That's what's happening, you all, with the US economic blockade against Cuba. But at the same time, even with that, not being able to get food shipped there, not being able to get parts, medicine, Cuba, as Shakura mentioned, has still been able to be a shining light of healthcare for the entire world. And that's why if you know that, it is insane to listen to them telling you that, well, people are upset because they can't get the health services. That I mean, that, that's insane to suggest that about socialist Cuba. And here you, people saying that here, you can't even go to the doctor here. And you saying that about socialist Cuba, you can't even afford, you scared, the minute you go to the doctor, the anxiety you have about what the bill is gonna be is, is more painful for you than whatever ailment it was that took you there in the first place. And you sitting up here talking about, well in Cuba, they can't even, they can't even provide for their people. I mean, what an absolute idiot that would say something like that. But yeah, you can turn around each direction you can face and you can hear somebody here spewing that nonsense out. And that's what we gotta put a stop to. That's what we gotta do. So challenging the legitimacy of these so-called protests, challenging the legitimacy, because they wanna tell you that, well, yeah, it's a protest. Now, you know, people don't have no damn sense in this country. The Proud Boys, you all, are organizing protests in support of these so-called, that should tell you all you need to know. And it's not like this has never happened. We just dealt with this in China, where these people having these so-called democracy protests in Hong Kong. And many people here believe that. You know, they want to uh, uh, get LeBron James, the basketball player, because he refused to uh, support the protests in Hong Kong. They want to uh, put him out there like he's doing something wrong. And most of us, well, he shouldn't have said nothing about China. No, that's not the problem. The problem is that you don't know anything. Your head is completely empty and you refuse to do anything to fill it. That's the problem. Because if you took 20 minutes to examine what's going on, what was going on in China, you would know that those protests there were just as fake as the ones going on in Cuba today. The same way they're demonstrating that picture on the first slide that Shakur presented on, guy holding a Cuban flag, that picture has been circulating as an example of protests in Havana. That picture was taken in Miami. And a lot of these pictures are being taken in Miami. They, they don't even care because they know people ain't gonna investigate it and look closer. One of the pictures that was circulating, they had a street sign in the back that was a street in Miami. And they didn't even notice it in the picture. And if they did, they, they didn't care because they knew people aren't gonna investigate it. And they said, this is a protest in Cuba. Like this is not in, this is not even happening in Cuba. This is happening down the street in Miami. And we know this same thing happened in Hong Kong. All of the credible organizations in Hong Kong when that was going on told you these protests are not legitimate. This was a labor protest in Hong Kong. That was one of the components of it when it happened. And all of the amalgamated labor unions in Hong Kong, about 600,000 people told you these, these protests are bogus. They have nothing to do with improving working conditions. How do I know that? Because I studied the situation. Because I don't believe nothing that U.S. imperialism said. They, they could tell me the sky is blue and I'm going to start investigating. I'm not going to believe it. Because they lie as policy. And I know that they started this tactic in the early 1960s when they destabilized the Congo. Do y'all know that it's documented? All you gotta do is read the CIA files that are had to be released through the Freedom of Information Act. And you can study this and, and you can see it where these clowns went down to the Congo to try to overthrow the National Congolese movement, the movement of Patrice Lumumba. And what they did is they showed on TV these people fighting. They said, well, the Congolese people are fighting. They don't like Patrice Lumumba. See, they're fighting. Here's the footage. They're fighting. And the people that they showed fighting 
were from not even from the Congo. And when the National Congolese Movement captured somebody, they shot planes down and captured these people. These were the one guy they captured was from Cleveland, Ohio, an African from Cleveland, Ohio, who had had been uh, just like William O'Neill, y'all saw the movie, Judas and the Black Messiah, stole some cars and they told him, well, you can go to prison or you can do this and get some money. And so this clown was trained as a pilot and was flying in the Congo and got shot down and captured. And when the, the National Congolese fighters went to him to interrogate him in Lingala, the language they speak, the primary language they speak in the Congo, this clown didn't speak nothing but English. And that's how they found out. So they've been using that tactic for decades because it works, because they know people aren't gonna investigate anything. And that's what they're doing in Cuba right now. And there is not a question. Clearly there is a fifth column in Cuba. And by fifth column, we mean many of them people in Miami. And you gotta remember 98% of the so-called exile community in Miami and in Florida are Europeans. They're white people. White people are never going to support revolution by and large because the revolution, they're benefiting from the oppression of the colonized people in these slave economy countries that make up the Western Hemisphere. So they're never going to support revolutions because revolutions are fought to overturn that benefit that they're, they're exercising under the capitalist system. So they fled and they went to Cuba. They left one slave-based economy to come to another one, the United States of America. And they down there and they will never support the Cuban revolution. And so they are fifth column and their friends and relatives that are still in Cuba are another fifth column. And don't come talking, I, I see all these ignorant Negroes on social media. Well, we need to listen to the voices of Afro-Cubans. You gotta be out of your goddamn mind. I mean, I'm sorry y'all, but I mean, that, that's just absolutely absurd. We have been studying and listening to the voices of Afro-Cubans for decades, there are books out here. What the hell are you talking about? There are books by people like Harry Valigas. This African Pombo was his nickname. This African was Che Guevara's bodyguard. He fought in four countries for socialism. He fought in the Cuban revolution. And then he went to the Congo and fought in the Congo. Then he went to Nicaragua and fought there. Then he went to Angola and fought there. And the, the brother wrote books about it and then went around speaking about it. And then there's uh, um, Brother Drake, Victor Drake Cruz, that led Cuban military missions in Africa. If he was what you say he was, he would have defected when he left Cuba. But he's in Cuba today after leading countless military missions against the imperialists in Africa. He's written a huge book talking about his efforts to fight for worldwide peace and justice on behalf of oppressed people of the world. There are so many people, Juan Almeida, there's so many Africans from Cuba who have written, I mean, this is absolutely absurd. We gotta listen to Afro-Cubans. What, what those people are really saying is we need to listen to these random idiots like them who don't have a clue what's actually going on, but just cause their skin is black, I'm supposed to, I mean, give me, I, Get away from me with that nonsense. Don't be close to me when you say that because I might spit on you, that's so absurd. And it's so disrespectful. So if you think I'm being disrespectful, I'm doing exactly what they're doing because we're gonna fight fire with fire. You can't deal with these people with integrity. They don't have any. You always lose if you try to do that. You gotta deal with them the way they understand. So yeah, if you say that to me, you're gonna get spit on. I'm gonna tell you that right now. And I ain't gonna apologize to you. And I hope you get mad and wanna do something because then we can take it to the next level. That's how I feel about this because I know who my friends are and I know who my enemies are. And you the enemy if you saying that kind of stuff. I don't care who you are or where you are, or what you think you know. You, you, you're an unconscious tool of our enemies if that's the rhetoric that you're promoting. And the only way to avoid being the person that Malcolm talked about when he talked about you been bamboozled is you have to have independent political education. These Negroes on social media, listen to the African, no, they ain't read one damn book about Cuba, ain't been to Cuba, don't know anything. Only reference they got is some clown that skin is black, that got a degree from UC Berkeley. I mean, that that's nothing. That ain't no analysis. That's all they got. That's all they got. They don't even, want, they don't even listen to Asada Shakur. You know, that's the African that's lived in Cuba for 30 years. 
I interviewed Shaka Asada Shakur. It's on YouTube. You can look at it. She's talking about life in Cuba. You want to listen to some Afro-Cubans? I interviewed this sister. It's on YouTube. Asada Shakur talks about socialism in Cuba. It's been up there for six, seven years. About six, 7,000 people watched it. Clearly, none of these Negroes talking this nonsense on social media watched it because this is an African from the United States who has been in Cuba for 30 years and is talking about it. That's when she had been there about 10 years talking about it. Okay, so get away from us with that nonsense. We don't want to hear it. And we're going we to push you down with that foolishness. So we want to say that there is a solution to this nonsense, you all. And in an hour, we can't tell you everything. But what we wanted to do in this hour is demonstrate to you that starvation is a challenge everywhere in the world. It's a challenge in this country, the richest country on earth. So we're not going to claim that starvation is a non-issue in Cuba, but we are going to say that as we demonstrated to you, starvation is much less of an issue there than it is anywhere else on earth. So there, it doesn't make sense to tell us that people are trying to overthrow the government because they don't have enough to eat. There's no tangible evidence to su support that. Uh, you want to talk about the right wing talks about, uh, uh, what do they call them? Uh, trauma actors or whatever they call them. They, yeah, they, this is a situation where that applies. Okay, this is a situation where that's real, where that's actually what's happening. OK, so that's the thing. They want to tell you what well, they didn't deal effectively with COVID. I mean, come on, y'all. This this country had from a percentage basis more COVID cases than any place on Earth. And the worst is not even over here. And yet you some people will allow these people to, to judge how somebody else. I mean, come on. That, I don't even understand how your brain could allow you to do that. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense to do that. So the way we combat that is we have so many resources here to help you understand a different perspective. And we strongly want to encourage you to use these resources. And not only you individually, we want to ask you to reach out to at least one other person and get them to participate. Because if there are 200 people listening right now, that's usually about somewhere around where it is. And if each of you talks, this is 400. And then they talk to somebody, that's 600. And then we can begin to have enough people getting healthy knowledge so that we can change the narrative. That's how we're gonna do it. But as long as only a few people are doing the work and you just consuming what they produce and then you're not doing anything with it, then that's, that's a criminal thing. We're not able to build capacity and move forward. So we need your help. Make it a goal of yourself to talk to somebody. If you don't know anybody you can talk to, then stand out in front of a supermarket and introduce yourself to somebody and tell them about all these resources. That's the lead. You got to do that. You can't be talking about, oh, I can't do that. Why can't you do that? What are you doing then if you're not doing that? So you got to do that. Get off your behinds and get out and talk to somebody. That's what we need you to do. Serious talk, serious business. So we got a ton of resources here. So we're just gonna spend the last couple of moments talking about things you can do to combat this. So the first one, again, we've got our new name, Our Ancestors Voices. We wanna invite you to join us next Sunday, August 11th, I'm sorry, August 1st, 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific time, honoring Pan-African Women's Day and a tribute to Mawana Coyote. Very important program, Saturday, July 31st, the flyer there in the middle-ish of the page. We have a Pan-African Women's Day event. You can go to the site, aaprp-intl.org and you can get more information about how to join on Saturday. We encourage you to do that because we will have representatives from our Pan-African sister parties, as I mentioned at the beginning, from Kenya, from Nigeria, from uh, Guinea-Bissau. So we ask you, and from Azania, what you call South Africa. So we ask you to participate with us on Saturday. And then on Sunday, Shakura and I are gonna pay honor to that program. And then we're gonna talk about the legendary Mawana Coyote, who was a legendary 
African woman freedom fighter who was a longtime organizer in the All African People's Revolutionary Party and the All African Women's Revolutionary Union, longtime coordinator of the Women's Union, and was active in the campaign after Amadou Diallo got shot in New York. That's where she lived, was active, was a representative on the coordinating committee for the first Million Man March in 1995, legendary sister. So we're gonna talk about her next Sunday. So please come and please tell people so they can get this information. Thank you. And go to the AAPRP-INTL.org site if you're interested in joining the All African People's Revolutionary Party. People are doing that, we appreciate it. But if you don't wanna join the APRP, that's fine. We're not here to argue with anybody about that. We tell you to join the Black Alliance for Peace. We tell you to join the Nation of Islam, to join Cooperation Jackson, the Malcolm X grassroots movement, to join any organization working for justice. Well, I don't wanna join none of them organizations because they ain't strong enough for me. Then you've got a responsibility to start the Ain't nobody strong but me organization and organize that for justice. Do that. And we'll even help you do that. I don't want nothing to do with the APRP. Okay, but you're gonna need a political education program for your ain't nobody strong like me organization. So we'll help you build it, even though you don't wanna do nothing. As soon as we help you build that, you ain't never gotta talk to us again because we're not trying to control anything. We just wanna get free. And we know that we can't do it by ourselves. If we could, we certainly wouldn't be wasting time talking to some of these people out here. So we need everybody to do it, no matter how irritating some people are. So we will help you build your program, even if you don't want anything to do with us. So go to aprp-intl.org. You can go to abetterworld.me to get more information. Every one of these videos, you wanna tell people to watch this because you wanna be like, I wanna, you go watch this so you can make fun of those people. That's fine. People do that all the time. Um, but you can see all of these videos are housed at abetterworld.me. It's an easy place to go find all of them. So you can go there. There's articles there. Um, please donate. We used all proceeds to help organize revolutionary struggles. So we appreciate that. I'm also on the editorial team for hoodcommunist.org. And you need to support independent revolutionary African media. The comrades from Hood Communist, my comrade uh, Erica from Black Alliance for Peace, Salifu Mack from Black Alliance for Peace, uh, my comrade sister Onya Samu from the APRP and AWRU put in a lot of work, you all. And so you need to not only read Hood Communist, at least tell somebody about it. Tell somebody, you, you read all the stuff, consume it, eat a big dinner and fall asleep and don't tell nobody about nothing. We need you to do more. We need you to do better. Tell somebody about it. Don't just eat fried fish, read the article, fall asleep, and then it dies in your brain. We need you to tell people so we can get more people engaged in this process. I try to be funny. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but we gotta, we all got to raise our game, you all. That's all there is to it. And on Thursdays, every other Thursday, our Hood Communist team on Telegram, you know, they kicked us off at Twitter. So we moved to Telegram. So go to your phone. You got a smartphone. You're paying all that money for it. So download the Telegram app. It's free. I even did it. If I can do it, anybody can do it. And participate on Thursdays, 4.30 p.m. Pacific time, every other Thursday on the 29th, we're going to be talking about all these folks who claim to be revolutionaries and attack people on social media. The minute you do that, you telling me you ain't no revolutionary. I don't give a damn who you think you are. You ain't no revolutionary and you are on the master's platform attacking other soldiers for justice. That is not what a revolutionary does. And so we're going to be talking about that Thursday. Okay. So we want you to join us so we can talk about that. And we have a number of these podcasts here. We have, I corrected all the information. Finally, I'm so thankful for that. I, you know, I've had a lot. Um, I've been on the road. I've been in four states in two weeks, organizing people, doing this work. So I'm here for a couple of weeks. And so I can catch up on some of this stuff. And I look forward to being able to do that. But we have the APRP Pontula cat, uh, podcast every Monday, 2 p.m. Pacific time, 5 p.m. Eastern time, forward ever, Saturdays. 
Revolutionary African Women last Saturday of each month, our comrades in New Mexico have their wonderful newscast, 11 a.m. Pacific time every Thursday. We talk to you about ours. We have Pan-African Women's Day this Saturday. We invite you to go to aprp-intl.org and register. You have to register to participate. So please do that. You do not want to miss that. People are still buying my book, A Guide for Organizing Defense Against White Supremacist, Patriarchal and Fascist Violence. I've been going around training people on how to create security plans, how to defend themselves, African people, indigenous people, trans folks, LGBTQ women, how to organize collectively to defend themselves. We are serious about our work, you all. So continue to get that book and let people know. Don't just buy it, read it yourself. And then, like I said, eat a watermelon and fall asleep. Like, you got to tell people so we can spread the word. You know, this is what this is about. You all, we need your help. We need your help. So reach out to us if you have any questions. We so much appreciate you. Please support all of these resources. We desperately need you to do that, to bring people to us. We desperately need you to do that. That is so important. Thank you for showing up here today. We appreciate each and every one of you. We appreciate the positive comments. We apologize to YouTube. It, we were not able to, there were some technical difficulties getting on YouTube, probably the police. That's okay, they will not stop us. We will keep moving forward. But we ask you to stay strong, stay positive, keep your mental, physical, and spiritual health. Capitalism has got to go. Smash patriarchy, smash homophobia, and this backward system, y'all already know that it's got to go. Have a great rest of your Sunday evening. We will see you at Pan-African Women's Day next week. And next Sunday, when we talk about Pan-African Women's Day and legendary sister comrade Mawena Coyote, have a great rest of your evening. Be safe, forward ever, backwards never. <laughs>